Gangs that I left weren't street gangs, they were very uh, serious organised crime gangs, but it is very incredibly dangerous. You can get left out into the bush, no one will find you. I realised that they were the defenceless beings that couldn't speak for themselves and they didn't have any rights at all. They didn't even have a right to their own life. When we violate human beings, we have words for that already. Now what people are asking of me is to use different words to describe what happens to animals, which are like what the industry use, which are euphemisms like. They're the words that make the industry and the public comfortable. Other, other vegans and that would be like, oh, what are you doing? You're making us look bad. You're making the movement look bad. You're way too extreme and aggressive. I think there is a little bit too much cushy, cushy, cushioning ourselves from reality to the point where you're going to be such a fragile person that you're not going to be able to do anything anyway. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Joey Carbstrong to the podcast. He's an ex-gang member turned vegan activist who con whose content has had over 70 million views on Facebook and 28 million views on YouTube. Joey, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to see you. Now, many of our listeners will know who you are and may have heard you speak at events like Vegan Camp Out. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with your journey, how did you go from being in a gang and I think you were in prison, is that right? Yes. To yes. becoming this sort of incredible force for animals. Yeah, it's an interesting story and uh, it's a unique one. doesn't happen very often. A lot of people who get mixed up with the world I was mixed up with uh, either stay in that world, end up in prison or with a drug addiction or dead. So it is uh, quite unique to pull myself out of it. I think I had a, a series of events that uh, gave me opportunities to escape that gang world. And I was luckily enough, lucid enough to take action when I had those opportunities. But basically, I, I, I just fell into the gang world through my... um environment circumstances family circumstances uh, no father in the house and um just the area i was from and you know had a bit of a rough childhood and i looked for kind of uh, male figures to that you know to influence me and they're probably from the wrong places and end up taking drugs and getting mixed up in drugs and then you know hanging out with street gangs and then it always uh progresses into more higher levels of uh crime and organized crime and then before i knew it i was in full-fledged organized crime gang and uh luckily for me blessing in disguise i got caught by the police uh carrying a loaded firearm wow. at the height of one of my um you know just going berserk on drugs and just just really like just not conscious of what i was doing really and uh it, it was a blessing in disguise because it, it could have been a lot worse it could something really bad could have happened you know it was just playing with fire really um, but it landed me on house arrest whilst on house arrest I put on a lot of weight uh, you know I was depressed filled with trauma uh, anxious alcoholic and uh, after putting on a substantial amount of weight I was 115 kilograms I started looking for a diet to lose weight and that's how I come across the raw veganism plant-based eating it was uh, juicing actually juice fasting and I did the wow. juice fasting. Yeah, I was this guy who was like a hippie dude. Um, his name's Dan the Man. And he was doing a juice fasting and, you know, just talking about the power of plants, basically. And uh, I did the juice fasting. I lost a lot of weight. But it, what it gave me is this mental clarity that I hadn't had before because uh, I was always eating meat, steak, bacon, eggs, oil, uh, drugs, alcohol. You know what I mean? My, I was just yeah. foggy and... Uh, you know, but when I started drinking these green juices and that, I just had this like crazy clarity. And uh, basically, it it planted a seed. It didn't change me completely. Change happens in like stages. But um, he he started talking about like when you eat animals, you take on the fear, everything that animal went through in the slaughterhouse. They don't want to die. The cortisol and adrenaline and that happens to everyone before they get shot, killed. You know, it just started like playing with my head a bit because like I seen karma happening in the gang world like bad things would come back around and get you and uh in the gang world usually like people that you have altercations with are kind of like in that you know world there it's like them versus you it's kind of a it's almost like a mutual agreement of war in that world <laughs> but uh 
the animals were very innocent beings. They didn't do anything wrong, you know, so it kind of played on my mind and it stayed with me. And uh, when I got sentenced to prison, I actually didn't have access to drugs and become sober. And part of that sobriety was starting to analyze my life from a new sober perspective, basically. And uh, I started to see the gang world for way differently. I seen um, jail, prison really differently. Like I just seen people doing like 20 years like for like one stupid mistake. And I'd looked at my mistakes and I was like, well, you know, very easily could have landed myself in there for a very, very large, long stint in prison. And by the time I would have woken up five years into that, I would have had 15 years left and been like, what have I done? So basically started look at my, looking at my life like that. And um, when I got released from prison, I, I basically uh, had a conversation with my mum about her smoking cigarettes. And um, she kind of said, look in your own backyard. And that's when I reflected about eating animals more the hypocrisy between me eating a cow but saying save the whales it was at that moment that I like reflected and thought you know what I'm asking my mum to to better herself but I haven't even bettered myself and I've put her through hell for the last 12 years and it was like in that moment that I decided to to go vegan and I went vegan the next day and I have been vegan ever since and it progressed into me being an activist and the rest is kind of history yeah what <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I, I really sort of that story with, you know, your mum really resonates with me because I remember when I first went vegan and I was suddenly like preaching. I was like, mum, mum, listen to this. Yeah. She's kind of like, uh, back off. But yeah. I've, ma I've managed to get her to go veggie. So I'm halfway there. But um, yeah, an incredible story. I mean, give us an example of some of the things that you do. So I am actually like a multifaceted activist and advocate. I do a lot of things. Um, activism was a natural progression of me seeing a massive issue in the world and wanting to do something about it. I was going to become like a, a counsellor for misled youth, pe uh, kids on drugs or people in gangs, helping people with mental health issues, things like this, um, because I was sober and I thought maybe I could help. Yeah, it seems more but of then a natural I, progression, doesn't it? Doing something yeah, like yeah, of course. I was thought maybe I could inspire people to, to, to get out of that life. But then, like, once I witnessed what was going on to the animals, um, little baby birds suffering and pigs in gas chambers and uh, cows in knockbox struggling to escape and, you know, no mercy for these animals. And I realised that they were the defenceless beings that couldn't speak for themselves and they didn't have any rights at all. They didn't even have a right to their own life, you know. And, and, and no one was really from... I didn't realize there's this whole movement going on <laughs> back then, yeah. but like I, from my perspective, I didn't see anyone talking about it for where I was in my neighborhood. And um, I thought it was such an injustice and it made me so angry. And that was, that was it then. That was what, that was what I was going to do. And I just needed a platform to do it on. And then I just started to like, I was very terrified to get on social media actually, because which is why I have a, a different last name. It's Carbstrong, but my name is Armstrong. And at the time I had just left, a, the gangs that I left weren't street gangs. They were very uh, serious organized crime gangs. And you know, there was a, it's a very dangerous world. It's not, there's a lot of things people don't know about that world, but it is very incredibly dangerous. Um, you can get killed, you can get, uh, you can get put in hospital, broken legs. You can get left out into the bush, no one will find you, you know? So when I come online, I was actually, afraid that I might red light like myself yeah. and everyone knows what I'm doing and where I am. I was trying to keep a low profile. So I changed my name, Joey Carbstrong, but I, I did my, I made my first video cause I felt it was more important that I leave a positive mark on the world after what I, what I'd spent my life doing, you know? And that was it. Like at the start, no one really followed me. There was a couple of people in there and I started mixing with the vegan crowd and da, 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 da. And then I just kept going and going and going. And I realized I had more to say, and then I realized that this was a bit of a battle and I just kept going, you know, and I didn't give up. And, and uh, it was social media, really, that was the platform to spread the message because that's how you reach a large amount of people um, with a with a less sort of less energy. So, yeah, I didn't really answer your question. Though. You said, what types of things do I do? And I started to go to. That's fine. I mean, I know you do. I mean, you sort of visit slaughterhouses and things like that. Do you do any like undercover stuff or is it more like 
sort of slaughterhouse vigils and things like that? I like to be where the animals are. So like uh, the SAVE movement, I started working with the, like going to the vigils that the SAVE movement were holding like in 2017, 2018. Not so, so much uh, anymore, although I still will. Um, but I do a lot of outreach on the streets. I, sh- I film my outreach so that more people can see that conversation. I don't like to just have a conversation with one person and no one else learns from it. Um, I started filming my outreach back in tw- 2015 uh, before there was these groups filming and shoot. Basically, I was the first um, to shoot my outreach on and put it on YouTube. And um, I started an interview series called Joey vs. the Public back then. This was way before there was any of this type of content online where I do the Socratic method and just ask people questions and help them lead to their own conclusion. But uh, yes, uh, later later on like i have been i have been in farms like in 2018 and stuff but i mean um from 2021 i started to get more into investigations and uh, did a series called uncovered um where we would go into like uh, factory farms and i've done a couple of slaughterhouse investigations and things like that but mainly like people would know me i've got over 200 million views now on social media um i've been on the uh, I've been nearly in every single newspaper in the UK. I've been on uh, TV in the UK and uh, TV in Australia. I've, I've been in a BBC series called uh, Veganville. So uh, I'm quite well known for speaking this truth uh, for the animals. And I've always had a strong animal message throughout the way. But yeah, the, I, I do. Being an act- activist these days is multifaceted. It's all online. I'm sitting in front of a computer a lot of the time directing edits you know, organizing, traveling, you know, shooting. It's, it's, you know, crawling around in farms. It's just everything, do everything all the time. Cooking shows sometimes, you know. Okay. So. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, do you think, so, I mean, a lot of the language you use is quite provocative, isn't it? I know I, I watched the clip of you on this morning and you were kind of on the sofa with um, Phil and Holly and some farmers and um, the, the, some of the language is kind of rape and murder and things like that. Do you think, yeah. do you think that kind of activism sort of works or do you think it kind of turns people off? I don't have the data on that particular thing. What I do know though, is that if we are an animal rights movement and we're asking non-human animals to have basic fundamental rights meaning that you don't have the right to enslave them and kill them you don't have the right to sexually violate them right us as humans have those basic fundamental rights when we when we violate human beings we have words for that already now what people are asking of me is to use different words to describe what happens to animals which are like what the industry use which are euphemisms like artificial insemination or uh humane slaughter or i don't know you name it but they're the they're the words that make the industry and the public comfortable you know they don't want me out here saying dairy cows are raped against their will they don't want me to say uh pigs are murdered in gas chambers that's that's what make because otherwise the the implication of that is that they're murderers the implication of that is that the dairy farmers are actually raping these cows so whether or not your question is whether or not is effective, I think the truth is effective. So if you're if you have a message, you better damn well make sure it's true and you've got evidence to back it up. And we've got thousands of hours of evidence, and here's a photograph, photographic evidence of them doing this act. So what I ask people to do is I'm like, oh, it's not murder, is it? So just just put yourself in place of the cow in the knock box. What is it for you? Uh, it's murder for you. It's not murder for the cow, though, even though we know a cow is a sentient, conscious being having their own individual experience. And when you rob their individual experience from them against their will, you expect me to say that's not murder. Even though if they want to bring out the de- dictionary, we've got definitions that apply to animals. They want to say, oh, the definition is a is a, just human on human. It's a, it's a cr- criminal offense murder. No, we've got plenty of definitions that apply to animals as well. But uh, I think it's because it's full frontal, it's like, bang, it's in your face. Yeah. They don't want that to be true, that human beings are actually murdering, mass murdering animals. They want, they want it to be, no, they're just, we're humanely slaughtering them, we're giving them a good life. 
and it's the food chain. That's what they want to hear. You know what I mean? So, yeah, whether or not it's effective, well, I'll tell you right now, it got me on TV, it got me on the radio, it got me all over the internet, it's got me 200 million views speaking the truth. Um, if I was not so um, full on, maybe it wouldn't have spurred me into the media. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe people would just not take me seriously because I, maybe I'm not taking the issue seriously enough. And if you if you don't if you don't look like you're taking the issue seriously enough as an animal activist, then why would they take the animals' plight seriously yeah. if you, as an advocate, aren't even representing their plight accurately? Yeah, it's it's such a difficult one, isn't it? Going like going back to my mum, I I sort of say things, you know, like use some of this language sometimes. <laughs> She's so horrified. She wants to sort of hide away from it. And I think that's the attitude of a lot of people. Even myself, when I see activists, um, when I'm out shopping or anything, even as a vegan of sort of five or six years and someone who cares deeply about, you know, all these issues, I do want to run away because I just... I'm I'm scared to see these things, the footage, and it's it's quite traumatizing. Mm. Um, I think there's sort of seems to be two schools of thought because I've had um Juliet Galatly from Viva on the podcast before, and she very much feels that vegans should watch, you know, documentaries that they've produced like Hogwood and you know, other things that aren't comfortable viewing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I've spoken to Dr. Melanie Joy, who believes that there's a lot of trauma in the vegan movement and we shouldn't force ourselves to kind of you know view these things um and sort of uh -huh. upset ourselves further so yeah I mean mm -hmm. how you know what do you think do you think us vegans should be should be seeing what actually goes on or well there's a very big difference between Dr Melanie Joy and Juliet. Juliet is an investigator. She's on the ground. She's witnessing the animals uh, going through what they're going through. She's been in, having to get vet care and dairy farms to get cows put down there on the spot. She's seen a lot of horrible things. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's on the front lines. Now, uh, Dr. Melanie, I'm not sure of that. She's she she's a psychologist i'm pretty sure she, she works in, yeah. in yeah so she's pretty much uh she's probably a lot very very disconnected from that herself now i do think there for me right this is this is a very important discussion and i think there is nuance to it i don't think it's black and white yeah i do believe that there is a problem within the vegan movement of people becoming too disconnected from the issue and then they become apologetic, and then they, they think that other vegans are extreme, okay? And then they say, well, Joey, <laughs> it's not that bad. Like, you're being hyperbolic, you know? You need to tone it down. You're pushing people away. You're making me feel uncomfortable. I don't want to go hanging around with my friends, and you're saying all this stuff, and, you know? But the, the, the vegans who get it, get it. And they're like, yeah, it's much more worse than what your words can describe, because they've seen it, and they've witnessed it, what's going on to the animals. I do think that if you're going to... Um, if you're going to be an activist, right? Because there's a difference between a vegan and an activist. Like, mm. If you want to help create change, you should understand the issue that you're speaking about. And you need to witness to some extent what's going on so that you understand it. There are some forms of um, graphic um, slaughterhouse footage that you really... I, I really don't see the utility in you watching it there are some things that are just so horrific and just gratuitous that i don't see why you would need to know that i've seen some things that just have they've traumatized me in the moment you know but there are certain practices that are very common that i think it's important for you to know about if you're going to be speaking for the animals and also, if you're going to stay vegan, and also if you're going to be vegan for the right reasons, um, veganism is a it's it's a movement based on animals, and it, and I know the movement's so big and it's so multifaceted now that people are going, well, it's about the climate, it's about this, it's about that. Well, no, not 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 really fun fundamentally. No, it is a animal rights movement, and there just happens to be really good other reasons to eat plant based, which is which is really fantastic. Which we should not yeah. ignore those issues, but. The same token, if I gave everyone the advice, don't watch what happens to animals. It's going to traumatize you. Well, that's not nuanced at all. That's a one, that's a that's black and white. That's saying, you know, there's, there's too much, there's vegans traumatizing themselves. Well, no, not everyone is going to be 
so traumatized that they they are, they are so help, feel so helpless that they're going to be stay at home with PTSD. That's just not not what's going to happen. A lot of the time, for the for the for most people who are who are sleeping well, who don't have a history of mental health issues, who um, are eating well and they're pretty stable in their lives. If they see what's happening to animals, it's going to anger them and motivate them into becoming an activist and seeing the the urgency in becoming an activist and understanding the plight of the animals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so although their their self care is important, I think there is a little bit too much cushy cushy cushioning ourselves from reality to the point where you're going to be such a fragile person that you're not going to be able to do anything anyway. Now, the the reason there's nuance is because there's certain people who would do them it would do them much better if they didn't see even some factory farm footage because of because you've got to know yourself and they would do really good and and let's just say they've seen it before they it 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 really messes them up to us to another degree they don't need to be mo- motivated further they're not turning all apologetic and beginning to like lose their principles and and go against other activists by going oh no that's you're too extreme you know you're too extreme yeah, they're not that type of person because they're they're the per- people I'd recommend to remember what the animals are going through go watch it because you know you're falling too far the other way now um, but the people who are, are motivated and aren't going to budge on their principles but it really does it just affects their work they they and they're doing some stuff for the animals. They do really good office work. They can organize, uh, they're, they're, they're in the, which are super important. Admin things, organizing, admin, all of these things are so important, right, For to, to help facilitate uh, things in the movement. If it, if, it, if it messes you up that much, you can't do that, and you've worked yourself out, you know that, then, then, then don't. But a lot of people need to see this because we need the mo- a movement full of passionate activists. So I don't think... There is a one size fits all for everyone, yeah. but I do think that for the most part, if you're going to be an activist, you need to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think you've described me in terms of like you know, I <laughs> if I see obviously I've seen quite a lot of you know footage and things, and it does really mess with my head, and I'll be waking up in the night going. <gasps> But, you know, it's, um, yeah, we're all different. And um, I do agree. It does motivate you to kind of get out there and be like, we need change right now. You know, animals are going through this. Um, Do you think we'll really sort of ever see a vegan world? I mean, obviously we all want that, but do you think it's, do you think it's realistic? So first of all, we have to understand what a vegan world looks like, right? A vegan world means that everyone understands the philosophy of not exploiting being cruel to animals and is also practicing that no matter their situation, right? So we're talking like the world is a very vast place. There's many different languages and cultures and circumstances. And there's a lot of like untouched, almost untouched places in the Amazon and, you know, you've got like deserts and you've got just vast, vast, vast uh, continents full of different people, um, villages. A vegan world would mean that everyone there is <laughs> practicing veganism and uh, no animals being exploited, hunted, you know, fished. So is it possible? Of course it's possible. But is it probable not really. <laughs> the yeah. probability is very low. So what is more probable? Because the reason I say that is because like let's like we, we almost have universal human rights generally, like the UN might jump in if they see you know, if the, like slavery is like human slavery happens around the world. Let's face it, there's sex slavery, there's all types kinds of slavery happening around the world. But Generally, if it's if it's found out about, there will be some type of intervention that can happen. Um, not always, but it, it generally is against universal human rights. Okay, but we have human rights in most places. Like, let's just we could just speak about the West. We have human rights in the West. Okay, Australia, UK, America. There's still some things that go wrong. Okay, but there's still murder 
in the red. There's still people who don't respect that. There's still people who, who rape and kill and go on mass shootings and do all these horrible things. So even though we have human rights, we, haven't, we don't have people who are practicing human rights veganism, if you know what I'm saying. So th look at it in the human context. We don't even, we're not even quote unquote vegan to each other, even though we have human yeah. rights. So if we haven't even learned to get there with each other, what makes you think we're going to get there with the chickens? So what I will say is more probable is we, we would get animal rights. Okay. Animal rights, not like, so let's just say, and it would happen in different areas. Like it might happen. Let's just say we, we got animal rights in the UK for pigs. Animal rights for pigs, and let's just say it extended to chickens and extended to cows, right? And then, and then based on those animal rights, you could no longer legally um, exploit them and kill them because they have fundamental fundamental rights. Not the right to drive a car, just the right not to, you know, to their own bodily autonomy, just to be left alone, yeah. that their interests are, are, are respected and not for financial interest. They're not commodities, you know, they're not enslaved. We could get that in the... in. England, even though there might be still underground black market meat producers, you know, slaughtering animals, it would be against the law, though. Okay, and and then maybe it, it, maybe we get it in Australia, maybe we get it uh, someplace in Europe, maybe we get it someplace in Africa, maybe we, you know, in in different areas it happens, and you know, kind of the way that gay rights happen and you know civil rights happen and women's rights happen, it happens here and there. It doesn't happen all at once like that yeah. because that's not how the world yeah. works. But we still have people who you know, breach the rights of all these humans all around and children all around the world. But it's against the law. So what I'm saying, a vegan world, it means, <laughs> what a vegan world actually means um, is veganism practiced, no exploitation, cruelty, killing of animals anywhere. Um, so I just don't think that that's very probable. But animal rights, though, that's a, that's a battle we can win, even though that even that's... Uh, a hard battle but I think it's more realistic yeah. to fight for so I love that idea I really like that idea <laughs> we need to really all champion that the pigs and the cows just having you know yeah rights of their own I mean you don't you forget don't you people say oh you know animal rights and you're thinking yeah stop them being killed but actually when you sort of think about it like you've just said it's yes they need they should have rights of their own they're sentient beings yeah, and if you breach those rights, you you have some type of punishment. Just like if yeah. I were to have, you know, in, people in my basement enslaving them, making them do things for me, and then killing them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would go to prison. That's how yeah. it should work for non-human animals as well. Um, and there's still going to be people who do this to the animals or to people, but there should be rights and laws protecting them. That's what I'm saying. That's more realistic because human yeah. beings are callous, cold, and violent. We're also compassionate, kind, and caring. And loving but we're also callous cold and violent greedy and uh we go a very sickening disturbed race okay and we're a very amazing int intelligent compassionate race as well but i'm just saying you, you, you can't to say that we can we can we can solve that you know just in a few hundred years i just don't i just don't know about that but no. yeah do you um do you get lots of trolls online like farmers and people that eat meat and things like that i mean i'm guessing you're the sort of person who wouldn't bat an eyelid at things like that you're not going to be <laughs> worried about getting all that backlash yeah so when i first so it's been a journey for me like obviously like i had uh from my past i had ptsd from the gang world complex ptsd i had um anxiety a social you know issues uh social anxiety and things like that coming out of addiction and things like that and when I got online I wasn't used to people saying things to me like that where I come from if you say something like that then it's going to be on you know what I mean so I wasn't used to just letting people talk to me like that yeah. um, unless they were a lot more vicious and violent than I was so yeah. um, it was just like just random people just just using me as a hitting post I was like so at <laughs> first I was like yeah come on then. really and triggered then I, by it yeah, yeah yeah I was like how dare you disrespect <laughs> me do you know how I'm and obviously no one knew who I was because I come from some neighborhood in northern suburbs of bloody Salisbury who's gonna know who I am but um but basically um after a while I realized like what are you gonna do what are you gonna do go to war with every single person who messages you yeah. like who cares after a while I had to like turn off my note I learned to turn off my notifications but so I started getting bigger and bigger in 2017. I went to England and, and at the start of 2018, I just blew up all over the media. 
blew up. They were like, who's this controversial gang member saying all these controversial words, um, you know, to describe what happens to animals. And let's go through all his criminal history. Let's go through his entire Facebook. Let's find every single thing that he's ever said. And let's run him through the ringer. Let's call his whole family. Let's call his friends from seven years ago in Australia. The paparazzi were like just onto me. Let's make all these like smear pieces on him. Um, I started getting really paranoid. And then I started getting like all these, these this hate, death threats all the time, every single day. People saying, when I see you, you're gone. Like uh, I get emails uh, death threats and violent threats all the time in my emails um, the farmers didn't like it too much that I was saying that, that what they're doing to the cows is rape obviously they didn't like that so they get people making stories up about me um, you know people want to just uh, throw my, my past of addiction in my face calling me a junkie calling me you know basically using the fact that I was in gangs to <laughs> to get away with whatever they wanted to do basically now <laughs> so they say well you did this yeah, yeah exactly so yeah, I've had it. I've had it years and years and years now. But at the start, the the thing that got to me the most at the start were, that I had to really learn about was that it was it was people in my own movement that I considered like that we're all a part of and that we're all in it for the oh, same right. reasons and you know that we're all like yeah speaking for the animals. And then I realised that it wasn't actually like that. It was it was uh you you had people who would focus on the animals and then you had people who were focused on you as a character and how you were advocating and that's not that's not good that's not how I you know so I got the the thing that that brought me down a lot was that when I was becoming very well known that people other other vegans and that would be like oh what are you doing you're making us look bad you're making the movement look bad you're way too extreme and aggressive you've done the animals bad you you know you, so you know, it was a lot. It was a lot for me to go on like a radio station. There was seven million people listening or whatever, and I thought that I've got to defend the animals here. I'm going to try my best. And I come out of it, and I was like, "Wow!" I just, I, I thought I did the animals justice. And I'd come on my yeah. social media, and there'd be people like other vegans just, just ripping into me, like. And I was like, "What have I done wrong? Am I not? I, I must not be a good enough <laughs> activist. I must have let the animals down." I'm, so I got really down about that. So it wasn't. I was getting all this hay and all this death threats and all this all the meat eaters, you know, all the that. But then then I'd get my own movement as well, and I was like, well, I'm I feel alone right now. You know what I mean? So that's a lot, lot yeah, to yeah. But you know, you deal with it. You have to deal with it. So you, I didn't give myself choices. I didn't say, well, oh, it's bad. It's hard. I'm gonna stop. No, it was you're gonna do it anyway. So you gotta be better deal with it because this just comes. Yeah. I started to realize that. I started to understand the psychology of people and and what what people's motivations were for saying that stuff they weren't there to help me they weren't saying hey man have you thought about this let me i really want to talk to you about this let's have a discussion about it and no it was trying to bring me down it was it was the, the, i could see the motivation it was way different it wasn't it wasn't trying to help me out or anything so then i started to understand what motivates people to say these horrible things and then i st it started not affecting me cuz so i was like oh yeah well i can read you like a book now so it doesn't affect me and if that that like you start you start like becoming immune to it and you start just focusing on the mission not you're not you're never completely immune to it but you do build like a tolerance to it and you you have to like kind of let your ego like my ego took multiple hits now like i, I realize that you know you have to let people if you're going to be online you have to let people run run you through a critical ringer otherwise you just can't be in that that line of work yeah i <laughs> i must admit i was i was terrified to interview you but you are so lovely i just want to give you a hug <laughs> oh thank I you think, you know you're just so passionate and it's it's amazing just to yeah just to hear you speak and and you know just it's very inspiring and i think you know you, what you do is just amazing um just thank to finish you. off if you could turn one person in the world vegan overnight who would it be it would be the person with the largest uh, impact, uh, influence, uh, following. Probably someone like um, the Pope. Yeah. Because he's got a billion followers. Oh, someone, wow. someone yeah, like cool. that. Um, maybe. Um, God, it, maybe it would be like the Prophet Muhammad. If I could go back in time, <laughs> then it would be like a billion <laughs> vegan Muslims. Um, <laughs> Or like uh, maybe if they're like the leader of China and they could just yeah. bang, eradicate, because uh, 750 million pigs are killed every year in China and China is starting to do these big multi-story um, uh, pig I farms. I about that. It's hideous. 
yeah. So if there was like someone who there who could just click their fingers and phase it out, then that yeah. would be the type of person I would turn vegan. Uh, someone with huge influence and huge power. Yeah, not really the um, British Prime Minister. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but we won't not. go into that anyway. No. <laughs> um, oh, thank you so much. You've been amazing. And um, thank you for everything you do, you know, for the vegan movement. Um, if people want to find out more about what you're doing, are you at any events um, this year or what have you got going on? Um, looking to do something really big next year, but we've been working, working, working a lot. So um, I'll be out, I'll be out on the ground a lot more next year um, is all I can say. I can't tell you too much, but just oh. letting you know that it'll be like a <laughs> pretty big next year. Okay. We'll keep an eye out. Thanks so much, right. Joey. Thank you very much for interviewing me.